Echoes of Eden is an insanely great book. Like I really enjoyed the, your first two, um, The Scars of Eden and The... Escaping from Eden. Frank, sorry, Escaping from Eden. <clears throat> really enjoyed them. But Echoes, I've just read it twice. And I felt like standing up and applauding when I got to the end of the the second reading. It was just superb. So much sexy history channel, paleo contact, you know, cool stuff. But the thing about you is that you, you're you such a pastor and such a spiritual person and you, and you don't just leave us going, oh, wow. You sort of then say, but this is this is what this means and this is what how this affects us and this is this is what you can do to discover this stuff for yourself and get out there and you know i think it's it's a special book really is it's a oh thank you yeah you're on fire i i think you know the next one's going to be amazing David. G'day, Paul. How are you going? I'm very well, thanks. You're looking magnificent this morning. Oh, it's very kind of you to say so. You look magnificent as always. Thank I, you. I feel like I've spent a lot of my life in that room you're in there. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and I, I think I might have mentioned this to you, but in our last interview, that magnificent cat of yours was lying in the background and right when you started to speak about the powers of nature and survive, you, you and I hypothetically surviving in a survival situation, and that cat just appeared and started stretching. And I didn't really notice him before. And it was just one of those amazing synchronicities that was meant to be. He was just, he looked like, you know, Bakira from the Jungle Book. Yes, he does. He does look like that. That's very true. He joined me for a conference at the weekend and he sat all through Stephen and Evan Strong's um, presentation in oh. rapt attention. And then for my presentation, he left. Did he? So, oh. <laughs> he must have thought, I've heard this before. I'll go for a walk. <laughs> Family, you know, it's like the old saying, um, a prophet is not honoured in his own country. Yes, yes, it must be something like that. He's heard it all before. Not honoured by his own cat, but there you are. Yeah. Now, for your show, do you prefer David or Dave? Let me get that right. Um, Dave. I, My friends, I've always said to my friends, call me Dave. So David's very formal for me. Yes. Okay. But, David, um, I don't want to confuse your listeners. They'll be wondering who I'm talking to. If I, I know. It's a little bit of a problem, but. I think I'm not sure in America if they say Dave so much. Um, yeah, I, th I think they do. I always use David on formal documents just in case somebody sends me a check in the name of Dave and then I can't cash it. But Yes. Uh, There's a movie called Dave, isn't there, which is about an American president. So uh, they, yeah. they must use it. Kevin Klein. Yes, that's right. I, <laughs> I vaguely remember seeing that. Yes, yes, yes. He has a heart attack and has to be replaced by a double who works in a deli. Ah, uh, yes, I remember that now. Yeah. Yes, it's quite yeah, fun. Was um, and I really enjoyed that the conference on the weekend. That was extremely interesting. Oh, it was. I do get excited when Stephen and Evan bring the skulls out. And there, there you've got the evidence right in front of you. The story of Australia is not what we think it is. And the story of humanity is different. Yeah. Well, I've always considered myself a very literate amateur historian, armchair historian all my life, you know. 
and I've been really into it since I was about 10, but you've actually opened my eyes to so much. You know, I, <clears throat> I did say, say to you last time, you remind me of the Sean Connery character in Name of the Rose. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, you're revealing the secret libraries and the arcane machinations. Um, yes. Background. I, I like that. I can just picture the two different religious factions staring at him with raised eyebrows, thinking, what's he going to uncover next? <laughs> Exactly. But he's just, you know. It's a good movie. Yeah, it's a great movie. And I, I waded through the, the novel by Umberto Eco. And I'm not quite the linguist you are. I only speak Japanese and Icelandic, but I can't. I don't know Latin. I don't um, read ancient Greek. And he just kept on quoting whole passages. <laughs> and there was no... Yeah. There's no sort of translations anywhere, so it was a bit like... Oh, crumbs. That reminds me of Theological College where you would read um, texts that you had to read, which were theological books from the 1800s, and they would quote Latin without translating it, and you'd be expected just to know yeah. <laughs> how to decode that. But, of course, your Icelandic is coming in handy right now because you're probing mythologies from that oh, part yes. of the world. I thought you might have been referring to that movie with Will Ferrell in it. <laughs> oh, no, I, I'm just thinking to have a feel for the language when you're reading those stories is probably quite important. Oh, yes, it's exactly as you're doing. And, you know, when the um, I've been studying Icelandic for 46 years, but it's always just been this hobby ticking away, very little input from outside. But since COVID, I, I just... It was like, bang, the gun went off every day, Icelandic, and I'm actually really getting somewhere. And Very as you say, the, the Icelandic, the old Norse literature from the 1800s, where so much was written, do the same thing, but they, they'll sort of spiel off in German or Swedish or Danish. Of course, as so-and-so says, blah, blah. Yes, that's right, yes. <laughs> um, sorry, I don't know how you guys learned all these languages, but... Mm. Uh, anyway, um, welcome to the Portal Superpowers. I, I've been really looking forward to this and I greatly appreciate you coming back. Um, oh, it's a pleasure. I always enjoy our conversations. Yeah, oh, that's great because I, I'm so thrilled for you how the world is embracing your ideas and you and you're a very likeable man. And as I wrote to you in an email recently, you're the... The sort of church man, when I left the church, I dreamed of meeting you and it took only took 40 years to find you. But I, you know, everybody I met, even the sweetest, you know, open minded, kind person, they still were so. I, I'd put my case and you'd see the that sort of it would yeah. just bounce off because it was like to actually acknowledge that I had a point would take them into a position where they'd start to go, well, what am I doing, you know? What, yes, what am I, doing? I think it's interesting because there obviously were some pastors and clergy around at that time who were onto this stuff because I'm now in correspondence with some of their kids who are now in their 80s. Yeah, right. And uh, just how special those people would have been because, you know, prior to uh, the internet, where would you go with your anomalous experience or your extracurricular interpretation? How would you find someone? That's it. You just wouldn't be able to. And so I, these, these pastors who were out there were like gold dust. Yeah, I tried to find people that I could speak to, but I either found people who knew nothing about the church, so I couldn't really talk about theology. Mm. Anybody who knew about theology was all, always very, you know, in the scene. And it's the same as, you know, what you've shown about translation. It's amazing how just trying to find an honest translation. And, uh, yeah, thanks to you, I found the interlinear Hebrew and English that I can at least in an amateur way search. And, you know, your research greatly helps and also Moro's, uh, Moro Big 
Piglino, um, I love his stuff. Yes. I've even started to understand a bit of Italian watching his videos. Oh, great. Yeah, because it's, it's a lot simpler than Icelandic, so it doesn't have all this huge baggage of grammar. So I'm listening and I find my brain starting to go, oh, that's that word, yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Italian is a great language for an English speaker to learn because the grammar is very similar to English grammar. And there's a lot of overlap of vocabulary as well. Yeah, you're right. I remember an old Italian man when I was a nurse, he, he liked me and he said, you know, you're one of the only Aussies that can understand me because he had a very thick accent. He said, I'll give you a clue. If anything that says your name, it will always be an English word that says, I, you know, I-O-N, like information becomes information. He yes. said, if you remember that, you'll understand a lot of Italian. You'll just, yes. you know, just take it back to your English word. And, and That's yeah. right. Exactly. Um, so I've, I've just made a list of a couple of things I want to ask you. I, I want to really sit at your feet, as it were. Um, I love that expression you use, sitting at the feet of the elders. That's very cool. Um, in your honour, I've actually worn my Scottish outfit. You can't really see it, but I'll, I'll show you. Um, I've got my... Uh, you got your tartan on. It's my sporran. Um, Lovely. This kilt is made from um, what's called Old Stuart. It's, it's actually from about 1745, the time of the Jacobite Rebellion, Bonnie Prince Charlie. Ooh. And I also have this. I wanted to show you um, the London Post oh, yeah. from 1746. And it tells of a couple of the uh, brave Scots lords who were executed in detail and, and a number of other brave Scots who were horribly executed. But it's literally, it's a four-page paper. But in the back here, it's got a wonderful um, correspondence from Edinburgh about how the young pretender's still on the loose and they're trying to catch him. Wow. Some of the stories. So Wow. A friend of mine sort of gave sold this to me for the right price the other day, and I was uh, over the moon about it. Oh, what a piece of history. Yeah, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it later, but I, you've really inspired me to look into my own roots and find all the mysteries hidden in there. And, um, mm. yeah, it's it's really been you. I, I never – I've read the sagas for so many years, but I – and there's many things that went ping, ping, that's odd, that's strange, wonder what that is. Yes. And now I'm like, what was that? Oh, I look it up. It's so easy now to look it up. And then looking at, at the Icelandic and I realise the translators are sort of either fudging it or, you know, there's other p potential translations that they don't want to touch. <laughs> yes. Because we all know such things don't happen. That's that's the That's the general thing, isn't it? It's like, well... That's just a fantasy. That's just the old Norse people were superstitious. But um, I, I wanted to really start just talking about um, Echoes of Eden is an insanely great book. Like I really enjoyed the, your first two, um, The Scars of Eden and The... Escaping from Eden. Frank, sorry, Escaping from Eden. <clears throat> really enjoyed them. But Echoes, I've just read it twice. And I felt like standing up and applauding when I got to the end of the, the second reading. It was just superb. So much sexy history channel, paleo contact, you know, cool stuff. But the thing about you is that you, you're such a pastor and such a spiritual person and, and you don't just leave us going, oh, wow. You sort of then say, but this is, this is what this means and this is what, how this affects us and this is this is what you can do to discover this stuff for yourself and get out there and you know i think it's it's a special book really is it's a oh thank you yeah you're, you're on fire I, I think you know the next one's going to be amazing <laughs> yeah. yes i'm i'm looking forward to the next one i am uh, working on it quietly in the background and uh, some of what I'm doing with Mauro is really feeding into what's going to be in uh, in book four, mm -hmm. which is uh, it's nice to have that um, 
the spark of a collaboration to uh, to energize a project. Yeah, and what a guy! Like he's like you. When I found him, I went, "Mamma mia!" Yes, that's this, right. Wow, worked for the Vatican. He's you know he's translating for the Vatican. I mean, whoa. Yeah, that's right. I mean, his credentials are not to be sniffed at. He to have had that job had to um, be thoroughly competent mm. in uh, the work of translation and his knowledge and understanding of Hebrew. And from the first time I discovered him, I I felt very fortunate to have discovered him, firstly, for selfish reasons, that he agreed with me and he had more qualifications than I do. Mm. But also because I think as a person, he really uh, embodies his journey. You can see the steel and the strength in him yeah. when you watch him present. And it's easy to connect his story with how he is. And I love what he's doing with me at the moment because he's very humble and very transparent in the translation work itself. He's not overstating it. Mm. <laughs> he's just saying, here are the facts. Now, would you like to do the maths? Yeah. And uh, he's very cool that way. Yeah, I love what he says about let's just pretend this is true, you know. You know, it's because the mark of a crackpot for me is always somebody who's an absolute believer, you know, and they'll tell you this is this actually really happened exactly as I tell you. So yes. I'm, and there is no other way, way of seeing it. Yeah, that's that's not yeah. really scientific and it's not really rational because we don't know. We just we're reading these ancient books. It could be all just a fable, but I think we're really getting uh, people like yourself and small way me and you know Moro and the great um, Eric, you know, and so many other people now are just forging ahead and. Um, I've been telling my friend uh, Colonel Alexander, John John B. Alexander, the um, the man who was the um, inspiration for George Clooney's character in the Man Who Stare at Gates. I've been telling yes. him a lot about you and sort of suggesting he check out your videos and whatever. And he's interested in you. And um, oh, good. Yeah, he's very connected in the states to people like. Mr. Bigelow, the billionaire. And... Yes. Well, he and I must have a conversation one day. Yeah. Well, I'd be delighted to introduce you. I'm, I'm sure you could probably get through to him, but I, you know, I'm more than happy to say. That, that would be great. We could have I a three-way call, conversation. To talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That would be super cool. Um, I also want, want to congratulate you on being published in German. Oh, yes. You know, that's... Being an old bloke, I mean, from the time before the internet when everyone could just publish anything, um, to get your book in another language is like just, you know, unheard of. Um, and there's a lot of people live in Germany and there's a lot of people into this sort of thing. Definitely. Yeah. And they're, they're real enthusiasts for it. Uh, you know, they approached my publisher for Escaping from Eden and the Scars of Eden. And then they approached me for Echoes of Eden and all in one hit. They knew they wanted all three. Yeah. They knew they wanted it in print and audio. And so they're, they're real believers in the work. And then to my delight, my editor said, I'm going to contact my friend Eric Von Daniken and see if he'll write a forward for <laughs> Escaping, which he did. So he's even more connected yeah. with my canon, which I, I feel very fortunate. Yeah, indeed. And just to know that there's that level of enthusiasm and interest in Germany is phenomenal. Spanish is going to be the next one because I'm constantly getting requests for the books in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And our second channel uh, to the fifth kind is a Spanish channel, El Quinto Tipo. I just saw and that. It's, and I, It's going I great guns. Spanish. It's amazing. Yeah, I was looking at it, El Quinto Tipo, and I'm thinking, El Quinto Tipo. Oh. Right, must mean the um, uh, fifth kind. Fifth kind, yes. Fifth kind in Spanish, <laughs> and it's so much of the world speaks Spanish. Mm. And when we do a, a launch on El Quinto Tipo, we have 
comments from all these different countries saying hola and it's such a lovely feeling of realizing wow people all around the world are watching this right now yeah. and are very happy to be hearing it in their own language so there's always a, a great atmosphere <laughs> when we do the premieres uh, yeah. for our spanish channel and so that's where the next book is going to go i'll self-publish that one as i have with echoes of eden Mm -hmm. and uh, the plan is to have that out for early next year. So my next line of questioning starts with your extremely interesting and freaky story, which I really relate to about the night schools when you were young. And uh, I was just wondering if you could tell us about how those memories came back, uh, whether through the hyp hypnosis sections and, and what it was about. Uh, what do you remember and what do you think it's about, um, all these kids yeah. going to night school? Well, my uh, personal stories of uh, close encounters and strange phenomena, most of them uh, are pretty unimpressive uh, because I only seem to remember a tiny fragment of things and, uh, and never quite get to a punchline. But with the night schools, it was interesting because I've heard from people who have far more memory of these things. You do remember the punchline. And I hadn't really explored the night schools idea at all until I was in conversation one day with Barbara Lamb and um, Mary Edwards, who have put together this beautiful book. Um, I think it's called Real Life Adventures with E.T. Friends in Space. Mm -hmm. And it's a picture book. And the pictures are of close encounter experiences as experienced by children drawn in a very naive, childlike way by a very skillful artist, I might say, Mary Edwards, who has designed interiors for the International Space Station. So that's who she is. And yeah. her family has a great legacy in uh, NASA and space exploration. Barbara Lamb is a licensed um, psychotherapist and has worked with people of all ages who have had close encounter experiences. So they came together, they put together this book with the intention of giving families a tool, families who had children who had had close, experience, close encounter experiences a book that would enable the children to share their experiences. That was the idea. And so they had drawn different scenarios. And uh, the idea essentially is for a child to be able to say, well, actually, picture number six is very much like something that happened to me, mummy and daddy. Mm -hmm. And they were going through this book. And that's what happened to me. While we were doing this interview, they opened up the page and they showed this house in the dead of night and there's a little boy on his bicycle secretly cycling away from his home and out into the woods. And uh, my jaw dropped because I was looking at a picture of myself, mm. uh, aged around nine, 10 years old. I used to do exactly that. Uh, while my parents were happily ensconced in the living room watching TV uh, and I was upstairs doing my homework uh, or getting ready for bed, I was actually sneaking out the house, getting on my bike and cycling up to the woods or running up to the woods. And I'd always go barefoot up into the woods and then I'd just go home again. Uh, my parents were never the wiser until now, of course, they read my book. Yeah. They found out. And as I realized, oh, well, that was me, I then had to become very puzzled because why did I do that? Why would I feel the need to do that? Why would I put myself in such danger? Nobody knew where I was. I was nine or 10 years old, on my own, in the middle of a wood, in the middle of the night. Why would I feel the need to leave the safety of home and go and do that? And that's where my recollections end. What I learned from Barbara Lamb is that many children do that, and some of them report when they get to the woodland, there are other kids there and there are other entities there who sit with them and teach them. 
Mm. And what are they teaching them? And that's really some of the question I ask in Echoes of Eden. What's the syllabus? Why would other beings from elsewhere in the cosmos have any interest in coming to planet Earth in the first place? And then when they get here, why would they want to meet kids? And then why would they want to run an education program? And if that's what's happening, and if that's what children around the world are reporting, What's the syllabus? What's so important? And uh, that's the question Echoes asks. Yes, yes. It's, it gave me chills, actually. And I, it's funny. I, my sort of next point was to talk about Sean's experience that you write about. <clears throat> and it's similar to, to what you're saying I, in that, I was literally rereading it last night. And um, do you remember me telling you that I had this vague memory through my life that I thought I heard a flying saucer outside my room when I was about seven, probably 1965? Yes. And I live near Archfield Aerodrome in Brisbane. So I heard all sorts of aircraft constantly. Yes. It was not like nothing wasn't one of those it wasn't a band saw it wasn't the sort of machine that people use it was a deep humming maybe it was that sort of bee humming noise that people report that i just remember it was a boom, 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 boom sort of noise and it but it terrified me so i started thinking wonder what um i wonder if there was any kind of ufo activity around that area when, this is not so long ago. And then I discovered that a family literally 700 metres away from me had been in the major newspaper in Brisbane with a story. And it's exactly Sean's story. It's like being woken up by a brilliant light, lighting up, you know, hundreds of hundreds of metres away, like daylight, um, mm. mother and daughter. And that's that's all it said in the paper. So I happened to be in that area one day and I went and found um, the older sister of this young girl who was the young girl who had the experience with her mum was about the same age as I was then. And uh, they told me, I talked to the older sister, the older brother and the girl, and they're all sort of, you know, like me in their 60s, 70s. And it turned out that you know, I haven't published this. I'm, I'm hoping that they'll talk to me on the record sometime. But um, she was, she woke up in bed, but the wall went right around the bed, exactly as happened to Sean. Mm -hmm. um, then she was back in a bed, but in the wrong place. You know how Sean? Yes, exactly the same. The bed was in the other side of the room. So she woke up with her head down the wrong side of the bed. And then I gently suggested to her on the phone, um, do you think that you, when you first woke up, you mightn't have been in your bed? And there was a pregnant pause and she said, yes, I know what you're saying. Yeah. And then later, weeks later, I thought, wait a minute, maybe when I was hiding from the UFO, they just put me back. And that's why I was scared. Yes. I couldn't remember what had happened, but I had this feeling that I was scared and they were looking for me. That's the main feeling I remember is they were looking for me or I didn't want them to come back or something like that. So anyway, so that blew me right out. I thought this must be yes. a common experience. Well, Sean's experience is, is so interesting for lots of reasons. I am very humbled that he was willing to tell me his story because he didn't tell anybody that story for about 10 years after it happened. He spoke to his mum and his aunt who were with him at the time of the encounter with the light and the craft outside their house, uh, but he told nobody else. And he had the experience just as you described where the light came he went into his room, stared out at the light, has no memory of falling asleep. And uh, then he has this experience. And then he wakes up in the wrong bed, lying on his back, which is something he never did. He never slept on his back. 
and with the most vivid recollection of what had happened in between times, which is of being taken into uh, a craft, into a room with smooth walls, no corners, and then interacting with an entity who showed him a baby, which appeared to be his baby, a, hy a hybridized baby. And the uh, ache of not being able to bond with that baby and have that baby having returned from the experience is a very significant uh, aftermath of the experience itself. Mm. I asked if there was any other aftermath and he reckoned there'd been a real intensification of his interest in ecology. Right. Living in balance with the planet since that time. But what's, what's a, a PS to this is that after this experience, he has reviewed the whole of his life and realized there were other things that had happened prior to this, uh, we could call it an abduction experience, this abduction moment. And he realized that from a very, very young age, he would um, get himself down to the local library before the age of the internet to research ecology, how to live in balance with the planet. And that he would in fact, while everyone was asleep and it was still dark, creep outside the house and get on his bike and cycle off down to the local library a good hour or two before the library was due to open. Mm. So what happened in those two hours? I don't <laughs> know, but he would wait and then he would read up on the topic. And then there were these odd um, encounter experiences that happened when he was very young, that he only, when he was sort of 10 years after the abduction experience, thinking there's a connection. These are all contact experiences. And the suspicion that he had had um, attention from cosmic neighbors really from the get-go. And if you read Sean's story in Echoes of Eden and wonder how has this story expressed itself through the generations of his family, well, then you'll have to read The Scars of Eden because his mum is in The Scars of Eden with an experience she had, which, again, only many years later did she allow herself to re reflect on and think that was an otherworldly encounter. Those people I encountered, I actually don't think were human beings. And it had taken her decades to allow herself to come to that conclusion. She'd always been freaked out by this experience she'd had, these people that she'd met, mm -hmm. uh, even though they didn't do anything terrifying, but she just had this profound sense of this is not right. There's something off. I should not be here. And she escaped from the situation with some missing time. And then decades later has come to the conclusion that was a close encounter with non-human entities. And I have conversations with a lot of people like that who have the experience and take a long, long time to allow themselves to give certain labels and interpretations to the things that happened. But when they do, there's this huge sense of relief at being able to say it and then being able to understand it because mm -hmm. I think it's the hardest thing to have your life changed by something you don't understand. And to come to a place of now I know what that was, mm. even if it's had some terrible effect on you ever since, now I know what it was, comes with a tremendous sense of relief and integration. Yes, and it really makes you, like you know, our, our mutual friend Jane, who I'm really keen to interview soon. We've we've become good mates. And, you know, she said to me after I told her my experience, she said, you'll probably find, she said, I, and I thought, she said, I find people who talk to me about their own experiences, stuff starts to come back. Yes, exactly. It's been like that for me. And like you said, you start to reassess because you, you have this, oh, that's what's happening. Oh, wait a minute. What about that and that? And, and I suppose that's what I wanted to ask you next. Like, how do you feel 
those night school type experiences, do you think you were being tweaked? Um, maybe, maybe you were selected because of they perceived that you had an intellect and a, even the cities sort of thing. The you know the yogic idea of um, abilities being inborn. You know, like something you can develop, but some people just have a gift and. <coughs> You think they sort of selected you for that and maybe for the sort of thing you're doing now, you know, like a long-term plan? Well, I'd certainly like to take it as a compliment uh, in that way, but I think there's a more general interest that our neighbours might have in children that's a benevolent interest, which I think comes to light if you look at an experience like the uh, Rua encounter in 1990 in Zimbabwe at the aerial school yes. where this craft comes and buzzes the school, lands just beyond the school perimeter. <laughs> Everyone sees it. So all the kids just run out the school to see this flying saucer and then entities emerge and interact with the children. Huh. And it was a mass sighting therefore, and very quickly, Within a matter of days, there were camera crews there. John Mack was there, the um, director of clinical psychology for Harvard, interviewing the children and asking what it was they'd experienced. A friend of mine has met with some, I have two friends actually, who've met some of those students. I'd love to meet them as well. And they had the conversations and asked the questions I'd love to ask. And one of the questions was, in the communication, was there something that you think these visitors wished us to know? And one of the girls, she's a woman now, one of the girls said, oh, I, I just love the way this girl talked about her experience. There's just a wonderful guileless innocence when asked to describe the entity. She says, oh, it's about the size of a year six. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's just so sweet about the size of a year six and I was rooted to the spot she said and I knew I was getting a download of information and I had a headache after the experience and John Max said is there something that you think he was trying to communicate or it was trying to communicate and she said I think they're concerned about what we're doing to the planet mm. they want us to look after the plants and the animals and again, just expressed in a wonderful childlike way. I think they would have an interest in children uh, and saying, you need to look after the plants and the animals. You need to look after the planet because they feel they can get the message through there. They may be having far more complicated conversations with covert government and think, oh, gosh, this better not be our only wicket here. Yeah. And uh, are talking to the kids for that reason. For me, I was certainly a very curious uh, young person. I had a great curiosity, and I'm very grateful to my parents for feeding that curiosity. I remember when I was about 11 years old, my mum bought me a book, The World Atlas of Mysteries, ah. and it had mysteries of the pyramids and mm. mystery of Velikovsky's theory, very interesting things like that, um, Sasquatch, what's going on there. And so that's the kind of mind I had at that age. And maybe for that reason, it was interesting for our neighbours to include me in a class of young kids that they were putting some thoughts and ideas to. I don't have any recollection of it, but it's, it's entirely possible. But what you just said, Dave, is absolutely true to my experience, that I have put the pieces together and remembered things and been able to interpret experiences from my own past as I have listened to the experiences of others and recognized what I'm being told and that's why in my Eden series I'm really trying to encourage people to share their own experiences in their own circles because I do think we're now in a place culturally where it is possible to have a conversation in a family group or a friendship group 
and share anomalous experiences. Have you ever experienced anything you couldn't explain? Mm -hmm. I think we'll get an answer from every individual in every group. And if we can listen to each other's experiences, um, period, then we might learn something and yeah. a coherent picture might begin to emerge. I was going to say without ridicule, but maybe that's expecting too much. If we share our stories and still laugh at each other's stories, but we've heard the stories, that might be enough for us yeah. to think, hang on, there was a pattern there. We all experienced entities that were not human, or we all experienced missing time, or whatever it was, or we all had experiences when we were 11 years old, whatever the pattern is. And it was like that for me after I published Escaping from Eden. I had people contacting me saying um, they had an experience they wanted to share, but they would sound me out first to see if I was a safe person to share their story with because they'd not shared it or they'd shared it and been ridiculed. And so often people would ask, have you ever had a close encounter experience? And early on, I'd say, no, I haven't, but I have many friends who have, and often that would be reassurance enough. But the more stories I listened to, the more I thought, wait a minute, this is exactly what happened to me when I was 20. I just only remember the first half. And in fact, I had five anomalous experiences when I was 20 years old, uh, which have puzzled me from that time to this. But now, having listened to so many other experiences, I realized I just didn't have the labels. I didn't have the language. And I didn't give myself the permission when I was 20 to understand those experiences in an accurate way. Now I can go back and say every one of those was a close encounter of the fourth kind. Mm, that's super cool. Now, which seamlessly brings me to the next subject I want to talk about. Um, I, I, sh I suppose I can admit this because it's so long ago, but I saw Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind at the drive-in in 1979, me and my mates sitting on the, the bonnet of um, somebody's old Holden, my combi vans beside us, smoking a big reefer, and watching on the big screen against the night sky. And, you know, we weren't that stoned. I, you know, I used, we used to smoke a bit back then as surfies and we were sort of partiers. But what I remember is that scene where all the people are on the road and um, they said, like, we, we saw something, what do we see? And next thing, the flying craft with all the lights come roaring down the road, doing this amazing you know, Spielberg sort of stuff. And <laughs> it was like it was just happening right in front of us. We all went, whoa, because the, the big screen was against the night sky and these things just went up into the sky and it was like we really saw it. And um, I remember thinking, wouldn't that be fantastic to see that in real life? And every time I'd hear somebody talk about seeing a flying saucer, I'd think, oh, man, you know, I would love that so much. But since I've been talking to you and things have been coming back, I've realised that I've had the incredible luck of actually meeting them. I'm sure that I have met them. I don't remember that thing that happened as a kid. I just remember the aftermath and I can put it together. But um, when you, you know, wrote about my story, I, I'm happy to come forward and say that I'm Jay, the martial arts master. I'm not from... South Australia, um, you know, from northern New South Wales, but that was a real story. And the thing about it is, since I told you that and since you put it in echoes, um, things have been coming back to me. And like the last two days, I, I was watching your one of your latest videos. You were talking about um, Astarte, the fertility goddess and I just went oh, it, it was like it physically hit me I thought oh my god you know like how old was that girl like I was yeah. 20 and she looked 20 and she was absolutely gorgeous Nordic looking girl but she said to me 
I'm not a I'm not from around here. And I said, where are you from? Thinking she's going to say Sydney. Well, and she says, I'm not from the earth. And I went, really? You're not from the earth? And then she says, you know, I, I want to have sex with you. Uh, if you come down to the Redland Bay, the mothership is coming to meet us. And I knew what a mothership was because I'd seen Close Encounters and it was just freaky because I'd, I mean, who knows, maybe sitting there stoned watching out there in the open, maybe they got the message, oh, this guy um, would like to meet he's us. He's interested. Yeah, this guy would like to meet us. So she sort of came and said, you want a ticket, you know, I'll, I'll take mm. you with me. And I chickened out, which was probably the sensible thing to do, but I sort of, if, if I got the chance now, I'd be, mm, yeah, maybe I might do this. Yes. But uh, what I wanted to say to you was or ask you, is it possible that such a person could be thousands of years old and could be a fertility goddess? Like, is a fertility goddess maybe these incredible women that approach men and say, you know, you want to get a bit of fertility going? You know, like, yes. Well, look, there are uh, plenty of uh, ancient uh, human stories that uh, report the experience that way and report a fertility goddess in those terms. Now, your experience is so interesting. It, it fits the pattern we were just talking about of an encounter that you then reflect on for decades to puzzle out what, who was that? <laughs> was that person human? What does that mean? But there are some really interesting elements of, of your experience. I was about to call you Jay there. Yeah, you and um, the one of the great punchlines of your experience, Dave, I didn't include in the telling, which was the girl's eyes. So I talked about her experience, her behavior, which is very, very odd. This very, very beautiful girl uh, coming to you and saying, I'm not from Earth. I want to have sex with you. Uh, I want to take you uh, around the universe. We're going to have an amazing time. You're yeah. going to have an amazing time. That's an incredible experience on its own. But I remember you saying that she had these incredibly vivid green eyes that are not normal human green hazel sort of eyes. They were, they were neon green. And this was decades before we had contact lenses that could give you these far more vivid right. at least uh, 10 years before they brought out irises and that this was one of the reasons this experience stuck with you and you thought was it true was she really from you know not of this earth because i've never seen eyes like that before for you personally that that was a, a really important element of the story and i tell your story alongside the story of a friend of mine heather who had a similar experience to yours, except she was kind of in a relationship with this person for a year, except it wasn't really a relationship. It was a series of meetings. And somehow this guy didn't seem to know how to get beyond that level of interaction. But I knew him. I met him. Yeah, that's amazing. A, a number of our mutual friends met him. So when the idea came... I've always wondered if he was human. I knew exactly what that wonder meant because not only was the behavior odd and it fits the pattern of she was being observed, she was being studied. This was a being who was trying to blend with human society and not quite pulling it off. Mm. He had this amazing um, uh, vibe to him. We all loved him. We thought he was a, a lovely bloke. We loved including him in our social gatherings, but he never really contributed. He would just sit there as a presence, not saying very much. <laughs> and, um, you know, at first we thought, well, perhaps he's just a bit immature, a bit lacking in social skills. Maybe he's somewhere on the spectrum. But there was a punchline to this story that, again, I didn't include in Echoes. And that was after the, this non-relationship ended. Heather came and visited me and, and told me about the end of the relationship. 
uh, where they just met up for the last time. He said, this is the last time we'll be meeting. I'm moving far away. You can come with me if you want to. Far away. Yeah. She said, why on earth would I do that? All my friends are in London. What do we have that I would move with you? And he didn't even say where he was going, but it was far away, apparently. Right. And um, yes, that's right. And so she was telling this story to me. And then she said, how old uh, do you think JJ was? And it was an interesting question because at that time, I had developed a real skill in aging people, English people in particular. And I would always take it as a challenge that I could pinpoint pretty accurately the age of any person I was challenged with. And I would look at the hands and I'd look at the neck. Yeah. Oh, you're uh, right. And um, I said, well, I know he must be a little older than this, but he, he looked 17. If mm. I judge by, you know, his face, his eyes, eye lines, neck, hands, build, I, he looked like a 17-year-old. Tall. He was tall. He was tall. He was nicely built. He was um, sort of Nordic looking. Mm. And, um, but I suppose he must be a little bit older, given that you're in a relationship with him. And she said, what if I told you he's 32? Mm. what and it was like one of those moments where the you know the camera pulls back and yeah. <laughs> it's dramatic music because now this really did not compute now i couldn't explain jj as well he's just lacking a few social skills there was something far more unusual about jj because his skin was absolutely flawless yeah. it was like plastic Nobody living in England uh, by the age of 32 would look like that, however good their genes were. And that was my moment of what in the world? Mm. So it wasn't the relational stuff that had clued Heather that there's something very different about this person. It was the physical stuff, the physical appearance of JJ. And so I don't include that because it, it's, it was a very personal experiential thing that might not impress anybody else, but it was the thing that got my attention and meant that decades later, when Heather said, do you remember JJ? I could say, yes, I remember him vividly. And yeah. I've always wondered about him. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. I'm, I'm like you. I've Even before as an artist, I had that ability to observe subtle things that other people seem to miss. And always being fond of women, I, I have an uncanny ability to pick how old they are. And I always look at their hands, condition of the hands, and just all sorts of things, little subtle things. And then I'd decide how to compliment them. So if they were, if they're under 20, I'd always say they look 20. And if I could, See, they're over 20. I'd always pull them back to 20. So it always worked. And, you know, obviously, if they, <laughs> you don't want to get it wrong. You old pro you. <laughs> Good on you. All. But I, it was sort of just, and it's the same with males. I, I just, I'm interested in people. I notice all sorts of things. And <coughs> excuse me, I'm not Sherlock Holmes. He could, he could really do it and work out everything about somebody. But, um, yeah, that was a great story. And, I, you know, when I read that in Echoes, I was thinking about sci-fi movies like The Man Who Fell to Earth and um, there was a mid, was it The Midwich Cuckoos? The, the sort of 60s movies about these blonde kids who were, like, freakishly good-looking but just blank. They didn't have much emotion. Yes, and that was the village of the damned as well. Was a great classic. Right, yes, that might be what I'm thinking of. And uh, yeah, blonde haired. There's also a movie yeah. which very obscure. This handsome young blonde haired English actor. I think his name's Colin Firth, but I don't think that's right. It's something Firth. He used to be in a lot of movies in the '60s and '70s, but there was a Peter Firth. Peter Firth. That might be him. He was a handsome fella, and yeah. Very young. And in this movie, he's from like a hundred years in the future. 
and he's i always remember him sitting in this pub with all these 60s groovers and they're all smoking and he's wearing this ridiculous hat it's just like this sort of really big hat he turns up and they're going whoa that's quite a hat you got there he goes well you know the radiation from the sun's very bad and you shouldn't shouldn't and then he grabs the cigarettes what are you doing you know he's throwing their cigarettes away and they're like huh he's going don't, don't you know that kills you you can't you can't that's toxic you know you mustn't so he sort of was like us now he's mm. like from 100 years in the future and somehow he's traveled back he was similar to that he, you know he didn't fit and he um came from a very different culture yeah uh, Yes, I think uh, I like sharing these stories, not because they prove anything to the reader, but, but because they encourage the reader to remember their own experiences or stories that have been told them by their friends and family and just begin to reflect on them. Because I think so many people out there have had anomalous experiences that actually belong to a set of information that's not commonly discussed. And the information is to do with uh, not being the only intelligent presence on planet Earth, not the only intelligent presence in the cosmos that we've got company. And I think that, again, if you sit down any friendship group or family group, you're not gonna be far from a story that's going to strongly suggest that information to you. So just to provoke people to share their own stories is, is my real motivation in, in sharing experiences like these. Yeah. And to use a Scottish word, um, uh, have you heard the word bumport? No. It's a sort of a Glasgow word. That's where my family comes from. So bumport means an idiot, but it's sort of affectionate. Like yes. So you're a twit or you're a dag, yeah. that sort of thing, a bomb port. Um, but playing the bomb port gives people permission. They think, oh, this guy's, you know, putting himself out there as a bomb port, a cracked pot sort of thing. But, you know, so I'll, I'll tell him the story. You know, they, they, they wait for others to go first. Of course. You, you break you break silence. I don't want to cop it, but yes, um, yeah. And you must have people constantly telling you stuff because they feel, oh, finally, he's somebody I can tell. Absolutely. Every day, I hear from people doing exactly that. And interestingly, this year, I've heard from a lot of people in their eighties uh, who are sharing these stories and not just reporting the experiences but who are joining the dots and are saying, now, at this age, my whole worldview is changing. And I don't believe what I did even five years ago. And I'm asking bigger questions than I did five years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm beginning to uh, suspect these certain other things. And I have an amazing appetite on me to find out what's really going on. And I think um, that's unusual. I think it's unusual for people in their 80s suddenly uh, to get this appetite for research on them and to go through a major worldview shift. But that's what I'm picking up from the 80-year-olds who are contacting me. And for some of them, it's rooted in experiences in the past. And for some of them, it isn't. It's just right now they're joining some dots and seeing some things and thinking some thoughts that they haven't before. And it's such an open-minded age now compared to when they were young. And I, I drive a little bus once a week for an old folks' home and take them to the shops. And they're my mates and they're all in their, well into their 80s. And we have some amazing conversations. You know, we talk about near-death experiences. You know, they're oh, thinking wonderful. about death because they know they're close. <clears throat> and it's, I just let it come up naturally, but I say, look, you know, a lot of people have had experiences that indicate this is not the end, you know, that and they're missing their husband or their wife. And, you know, so have a look at this. Go and check out this person, Dr. Moody, different researchers. Have a look online, you know. And um, I think it's such a blessing for them because in the past it was forbidden to talk about such things in polite society. 
and because people found it disturbing to talk about death or it had to be in a religious context. Otherwise, what are you, some kind of heretic or weirdo? And Which sort of brings me to the next topic I wanted to ask you about. You've, in the echoes, you really elaborate wonderfully on the suppression of knowledge and how, how it's been done with all those, you know, those shocking stories about the Cathars, about the persecution and what I, I love what you, the way you say it, the, um, the Roman uh, Department of Religion, you know, the Imperial Religion Department, that just goes mm. click with me. I think, yes, that's exactly what it is, um, that orthodoxy. And um, that suppression seems to be right across the board. People now are not as religious as they used to be, so that religious suppression has been lifted by just common, just by people losing interest in church. And, I mean, my friends who are in their 40s know nothing about Christianity. It's like, it's Mm. quite amazing. They just... Most of them have no Christian background, so they don't know even, they didn't go to Sunday school, they don't even know the basics of it, which is quite interesting. But that that suppression on Wikipedia and TED Talks and, you know, all these things all just say blatantly, oh, you know, it's all pseudoscience, nobody's ever... Nobody's ever met an alien. Nobody's ever seen a spaceship. There's no evidence at all. Nobody's ever had a telepathic event. Um, these things are impossible. And I, I even read this um, really amazed me. A scientist, a scientist wrote a big article I found somewhere essentially saying the exact inverse of what I believe science is saying, that consciousness is the, um, the foundation and matter arises out of consciousness. And this quantum theory has proven this. And he was saying exactly opposite. He goes, oh, that's all rubbish. You know, uh, consciousness comes out of matter and therefore, um, you know, these things are just fantasies, hallucinations and whatever. And I thought, wow, that's hardcore. You're like either really ignorant or you're really well paid to say this. You know, this (laughs) feels like there is a, you know, the scientific department of denial that looks after this stuff. Well, there is a uh, conservative energy built into the world of academia through the process of peer review, of course. Mm. Um, I think it's very often from outside the world of tenured professors that radical new ideas often come. Yes. And then the academics come to the party. They will discuss this crazy thing that this writer has said. And they'll be able to bounce the ideas around that way and say, well, he may have a point here or he may have a point here. But really, for someone who wants to keep tenure to come out and say something that contradicts basic worldview assumptions of the university and uh, rubbishes all their colleagues around the world doesn't happen very often. Mm. And I think um, I, in a way, I take courage from that knowing that that is the role of the writer. It's not my role to be a tenured professor and to have PhDs coming out of my ears. Uh, My role is to put the radical thing on the table so that uh, the general public can talk about it. And then if they want to, academics can come to the party and uh, uh, play with the ideas. If he's in uh, one department of the university, then he's probably within the conservative mainstream of his field. If he was in the philosophy department, he would be out of kilter Mm. because in the philosophy department, everyone there would have read Plato and would know that the idea that the material cosmos emerges from consciousness is at least two and a half thousand years old and was put forward by one of the greatest minds of all time, Plato, whose work is really foundational to anything we would call philosophy or modern Western thought. There's a famous British mathematician and philosopher who says that the whole of the Western tradition of philosophy could be summarized as no more than a series of footnotes to Plato. And no one has disagreed with that. Plato argued that 
consciousness precedes material. And uh, he, if you put him alongside uh, Einstein, it's kind of interesting because Einstein, with his elegant suite of quadratic equations, proved, as far as I understand, that energy, space, matter, and time all began at the same moment. This is a mind-boggling concept, but this is essentially what he says. And what does that mean? That means that you and I are always intrigued by what was before. What was the universe like before it was like this? What was the planet like before it was like this? And we want to go further, further back with our what was it like before questions. And according to Einstein's theory, you go far enough back, you'll reach a point where before doesn't mean before anymore, because that's where time begins. Yeah. And when you reach the point where before no longer means before, and you look around you, you'll be seeing a unified field of intelligence and consciousness. That's Plato. That's what Plato said. Mm. And therefore, that what emerged in the Big Bang, the material universe, was an emanation from consciousness, mm. from intelligence, from thought. So uh, the chapter you were reading might be in the conservative mainstream of his field, but the idea that we're hearing referenced in quantum research that consciousness shapes material reality is ages old and has a much better pedigree than perhaps that fellow was aware. And of course, we have to realize that when people have um, three PhDs in one discipline, their area of expertise is getting narrower and narrower and narrower with every PhD. And so we shouldn't assume that because someone has three PhDs, they can talk about every topic under the sun and get it right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, many years ago, I had a a long email conversation with a scientist who was associated with the ABC and he was investigating telepathy and he was basically reaching out saying anybody's had experiences or believe they had I'd like to hear from you I don't believe it's possible I believe it you know breaks the laws of nature let's have a chat so I started writing and I we you know he's a nice guy and we, we had a really interesting chat and I told him I'm not somebody who says I can do this all the time but I've had an a number of very anomalous telepathic experiences, which are just telepathy. You, you really can't, you know, if you believe I'm not a liar, these things are, but he just couldn't believe it. And I came to a point where I realized I wasn't, I couldn't change his mind. It's like talking to the convinced, you know, religious person. It's, you just reach that point where it's like, they're just stubbornly like, sorry, but you're not going to get me to move from my position. I'm, I'm trying my best to be open-minded, but really, you know, I know, not. I know, yeah, I know what's <laughs> right. I know the way things are. Yeah. So I sort of took a leaf out of Jesus' book, you know, how Jesus would be asked some sort of trap by the Pharisees, and then he would just completely seem to come from a different direction and speak to the heart of the matter, and they'd be like, what? That's not what I just asked you, but he'd sort of see where they're really coming from. And I said to this guy, listen, man, I really like you, but you seem young. And I think what you need to do is get bent. You, you need to wake up in the gutter somewhere, hung over, not knowing where the hell you are. You know, you need to go out with some wild women. You need to get yeah. stoned, you know. You get need, out of your depth. Yeah, because you're just, you're in this box the reason you can't hear me is because you've had no experience. You just, you think you know it all with all this head knowledge, but you've got to get out into the big world and start meeting people and, and having experiences having where experiences. something yeah. says duck and you're duck and you just miss death. You know, when, when you have those experiences where death shaves past and something said duck or step right or whatever, you think, wow, I don't really logically understand what that was. That's, something told me that's when you'll start to feel this stuff but yeah yes that's exactly right and you, hopefully he's had some experience since yes well you never know he um he never wrote back to me but you know it's like i i was going to say about um you know the very trenchant mindset 
Um, I don't know if you had the chance to see my my video where I was talking to the Shared Crossing project as yet, but I, I, I sort of basically, I had an upload problem, so you were keen to see it. But um, anyway, I, I tell the story about on three occasions, people who define themselves as atheists who told me to my face, uh, there's no God, religion is BS, um, right? Just, just said straight out. And then they said, but you sort of seem fairly cool guy. Why do you believe this? And I started telling them the story of basically my near-death experience. But as I came to the climax of the story where I, I cried out to Jesus to, to save me from a situation and then was taken to a sort of a Elysian Fields type heavenly place of grass and all this bliss. Something happened where it was as if I just vaporized and this light came out of me and completely enveloped them. And on these three occasions, they went, ah, oh, who are you? And they, they, they started crying. You know, these are all men, the sort of guys who don't cry, um, at least back then. And they were just like completely overwhelmed by the reality. And I was so completely overwhelmed, I couldn't speak. It just was, I was just absolutely caught up in bliss. And each one of them ran away from me and, and called out, Thank you. Uh, it's real. <laughs> this is too much. I can't be here. I can't. I can't wow. stay in this. The presence of what's happening here. And this, I was no saint, but you know, I was at the time. I, you know, I'd been had the near death experience probably a year or, or two before, so it was very real and raw to me. But that was um, the thing that they. I could have sat there and blah, 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 trying to convince them it wouldn't have worked. But what happened was, you know, God stepped in and the great divine reality said, yes, I'm real. And they went, wow, I didn't expect that. It was the last thing they expected. And one guy, we were actually having a couple of beers and he had a smoke hanging out his mouth, his young cynical Scots fella great friend of mine, he's going, oh, Dave, he's the guy who used to call me a bomb pot all the time. He goes, you're such a bomb pot, believe in this stuff. It's all crap. And I'm going, oh, well, this is what happened. And he's like, what's that? What's that? What am I feeling? You know? And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the, the truth is uh, beyond the intellect, isn't it? It's, it's just real. Um, yes, it is. Uh, you know, we read about people in the past who um, exhibited phenomena like you just described, where their bodies are emitting light, for instance, just as one example. And when we read about it in the past, we often have a habit of saying, oh, well, that's obviously a dramatization of what really happened. Yes. Uh, you know, they've they've um, sexed that up a bit. You know, they've made it more cinematic. Um, and then you have an experience like yours and you realize, well, <laughs> that happened to me. Then probably when the people who wrote about St. Seraphim of Saroff said his body emitted light, they were actually telling the truth after all. Yes. Or when the um, Cathars talked about the light body and manifestations of the light body. Could they have meant it literally as well? And uh, sometimes we have to give a second hearing to people who we've uh, put in the wrong box or dismissed in the past yeah. because of a paradigm shifting experience like the one you just described. I've got a picture here. Don't, don't go away. This is, uh, this is my friend who uh, used to emit light. And his name is Seraphim of Sarov, who was a Russian Orthodox mystic hermit, lived from 1759 to 1833. Uh -huh. And he had a um, discipline of controlled conscious breathing as a way of altering his state of consciousness. And then he would have telepathic experiences, like you describe. 
He would be able to affect healing in people's bodies. He would have this incredible uh, ability in remote viewing, future viewing. And people at the time described six occasions when they saw his body doing what you just did. And I know you have very similar beards. I was just so, thinking uh, that it's definitely a mark, isn't it? Maybe that helps you. <laughs> you know, it's funny, though, beards. Um, and this does come back to Echoes of Eden. But, you know, if you picture a wizard, picture Gandalf, picture Merlin, they all have this long beard that they play with when they're thinking, why is that? And I'm beginning to think it's connected with something that I've learned as I have sat at the feet of elders of indigenous traditions, learning about their protocols for healing, which are contact protocols, as I talk about in Echoes of Eden. And traditional shamanic healers will use jish as a way of tuning in to conversations going on in the ether about you that are there to support your progress through life there to support your healing the shaman will tune into these cosmic conversations by using jish which is the light of fire and they'll watch how the fire is influenced by the energies in the room or mm -hmm. they will throw bones shells uh, stones sticks and see how they are shaped by the energies in the room to tune into this conversation. And many of our world's indigenous cultures say that every one of us has built in jish and it's our hair. And that's why uh, traditional healers in many cultures, male and female, will not cut their hair. Mm -hmm. And that's why if you look at um, Native American traditions, very often not cutting the hair is a very important aspect of personal growth and development because it is through your hair that you tune into the environment around you and it's regarded as a way of tuning into um, invisible channels of information. So maybe that beard that Seraphim had, maybe the beard that you have is serving a purpose beyond personal beauty. Maybe it's part of some very, very ancient traditional wisdom. Yeah, like a, I was, or something. Exactly. When I was researching Echoes of Eden, uh, I, it was only then I started joining these dots and realizing that some of these stories that we've just dismissed as fiction, fable, um, metaphor, may have a little bit more going on uh, than we thought. And often through the prejudice that we are clever and our ancestors are stupid we're taught to distance ourselves from stories like that or customs like that when in fact there may be legitimate uh, human technology and information buried in them mm. and that's why it's important for us to tell our stories because as you say it it makes you think like that saint you just showed us i I've actually been questioned, the, the guy from the Shared Crossing Project said to me, do you think others saw the light? Because um, the, the first, probably most profound occasion, I was in a chook shed, like at a, a country fair. And there was, I remember there was quite a few people in there, but then there was just me and this guy as the conversation started. But I don't remember people, you know, running out, screaming, going, what's going on? So I suspect they didn't see the light. I, I don't know how I saw it in a way. It, was, it, was, it literally felt like, you know, treasure in earthen vessels, the, the biblical mm. saying. It felt like my flesh sort of sizzled apart. It was like... And it took me, to, I didn't know it was coming. I was just telling the story and I was, I was sort of reliving it and I could feel the love and the bliss and, you know, just crying out to God. There was this like monstrous bell rock sort of thing about to take my soul. And I, I was powerless and frozen in terror and I, I threw my head back and I screamed out Jesus, who I believed in, 
sincerely. And as I screamed out the word, the, the word came back into me that I just turned into this massively powerful lion, wizard, something, you know, and I just killed this thing and then I went to this heavenly place. So as I was saying this, this guy, I felt like everything just peeled away and it was as if God or an angel was standing there, but the light was extreme, like, and I was speechless with bliss and this light consumed me and I sort of felt sorry for the guy. I remember feeling a little bit sorry because I'd, I was living, you know, pretty much in a monastery in this true vine Christian community. And we used to get up at five in the morning and pray and sing. And all day long, I was working on the land, praying to God, speaking in tongues, reading the Bible. So I was, I was a fanatic. And, and basically, I was sort of used to this stuff a bit. And this poor guy was going, oh, it's all bullshit, man. <laughs> it's like, oh, what's this? <laughs> Boom. And it was, it was as if heaven opened behind me and you know god or an angel or being standing there and this guy was like he was overwhelmed by it so yeah it was sort of special and i certainly didn't get it because i'm a good bloke it was just i was just available you know that's yes yeah my secret to spirituality is i'm sort of like king david i'm a bit of a i'm a bit of a bastard in some ways but I love God and God just goes, oh, he'll do, you know. This bloke's sort of simple. <laughs> I can get through it. <laughs> he can do the job. Very good. Good way to be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how's your time going? I, I see that we're almost an hour and a half. All right. Let's go for another five minutes. All right. I, I absolutely love talking to you. I, I just I wanted to tell you... Um, Super quickly, my Nordic research is bringing up the most astounding things. I sort of took your challenge at the end of Echoes, go out and look at your own tradition. So I've been looking at the Norse, Scottish, which is a very similar thing. Mm. And wow, you know, I'm fine. Like, have you heard of Snorri Sturluson? No, I don't think so. He's, he's the great Icelandic writer from 1300. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, he wrote a lot of the sagas. He wrote this super famous one called Hames Klingler, which is the, the history of the round world. But it's it's sort of the, the history of the Norse kings going right back into prehistory. And he's the guy who wrote the Edda, which is all about the gods. And we made most of our Norse mythology from this guy. But there he is writing in 1300 in little old Iceland, yeah, freezing Iceland. And he's actually, he sounds like a modern scholar. He's basically going, look, you know, I'm trying to write a history here from the very best sources. I've talked to the old people. There's all these poems that everyone remembers. You know, I know it's a couple hundred years since the Viking age, but we remember these poems and of course they rhyme. I think they're credible because, you know, this is hard to write this stuff. And so people have remembered it. And I've talked to the old people about what they remember, that the old people telling them about the gods. And so you're thinking, okay, so we're going to get this whole thing about, you know, gods and having wings and all that sort of stuff. But what we actually get is there was these people who are really super advanced living in Asia, in Asia Minor, in, in Troy, who weren't gods, but they were really powerful people and they could do things that other people couldn't do and they could move around really fast and um, they built these huge buildings and they had these massive buildings that had like 400 rooms and were like a kilometre long and I'm just going, wow, you know, I've read this before, but I'm reading it going... And then I started looking up and like Thor seems to have been the main guy before Odin became sort of the all-father, but who originally seems to have been the big kahuna. So I go, he's, he's got a, um, a huge building called um, something like Skilbithnir, something like that, 400 rooms. So I look it up, and the first thing I come up with is Stargate, and they've got this whole thing about these Asgardians the the Aus is the gods, you know, these Ausir. 
and they've got like a spaceship for Thor that's, you know, this massive spaceship and it's like, wow. So people have already been making these connections in the past. So I'm reading it in yes. Norse. I'm reading it in the old, you know, thousand-year-old language and just blowing my mind. And and chariots, you know, it's all chariots, chariots of the gods, but they're sort of yes. the Norse gods. And... Well, it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, what the uh, old folk were saying in the 1300s was they, they were not gods. They were people but they were very advanced Elohim. and they had advanced ability in locomotion and, and travel and you know you listen to that now and you think oh that's what we're talking about because for so long we've as soon as the small g god's word has been attached to them that story goes in a totally different basket doesn't it Yes. And I, it, it's similar with the, the Greek gods. I mean, once you read the stories of what these beings did, you can take that small g gods word away because they're clearly not that. Yeah. You know, they're mortal beings. They, they have all kinds of conflicts. They kill each other. Yeah. <laughs> and then they do what so many of these powerful entities do in stories around the world. They hybridize. Um, they conflict with one another for hegemony etc they conflict over project humanity and how many humans there should be how smart they should be and you go back and read the stories again with that sort of religious gloss taken away and i think it becomes clear quite quickly what you're looking at and we now have other language to tell yeah. that story with yeah and this guy snorri sturluson He's actually saying, you know, I think that Thor was Achilles. I think that Odin was Jupiter or Zeus. You know, it, it makes the connections. I sort of know where it all is now, and I'm just taking my time going through it and looking up, you know, the best dictionaries and talking to my Icelandic friends, not necessarily telling them why I'm researching this, but how do you interpret this? What do you, as a native, how do you, how does this word feel to you but um yes there's so happy. much words are fascinating there's so much uh, information carried by the words in the stories and i would love to read the material you put together in your book when it comes out on all the icelandic story i'm looking forward to a conversation with a friend of mine who studied the language of papua new guinea uh, because in the vo vocabulary of PNG appears to be the memory of entities who would commute between here and the moon. Wow. And they were physical entities that looked like a gecko, but used technology. Huh. Oh my goodness, I think I can almost picture that. And the memory of it is embedded in the vocabulary that still exists in the language of PNG today. Um, the Philippines, very, very similar where you've got words that uh, embody whole narratives. And what's really intriguing, when I talk to my Filipino friends, I have a, a big Filipino following, uh, mm. apparently, and I get lots of messages and communications from viewers and readers in the Philippines. And I share some Filipino story in the Scars of Eden, in particular, their story of the rehabilitation of planet Earth their stories of hybridization and um and i'll i'll share the story i'll share the vocabulary with which the story is told and i get two reactions some filipino friends said excuse me i'm a native filipino i've never heard these stories before in my life and uh, others will say yes this is what my father told me my grandmother told me my school teacher told me and the reason you've got those two responses is that these stories are carried at the level of folklore. Mm. And uh, you just might not be in that loop. If you don't have a family that values the old stories and you go to a modern 21st century school, you might never hear these stories, yep. even if you know the words. Uh, so that's the really intriguing thing. There are some countries where the folklore 
is much further forward in the mix. Probably Iceland is one of those places. Ghana is another. But there are other places where the folklore has been more highly suppressed. If a country has been very strongly evangelized or Catholicized, then very often the folklore will be carried by a portion of the population, a, a proportion of the families, and be totally unknown to other. And uh, I've been really thrilled to get response from people uh, from the Philippines and from African countries as well, saying, thank you so much for telling our story because it's not even told in our own country. And right. now you're shining a light on it. And uh, it, it's the time to do that. It really is the time to bring out the gold of our indigenous traditions in terms of story and memory, because I think more of us are ready to listen with an open ear than in times past. Yeah, brilliant. And you're certainly a great catalyst for this, really having a, a tremendous effect. I hope so. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, Thanks, Dave. I always enjoy our conversations. We're going to have to have another one soon. Oh, any time. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to hearing more of your research into the Icelandic stories and Icelandic language. There's something about it that I think is very resonant to people of all cultures. That's why there's so much of it in the Marvel universe, <laughs> for instance. Yes. And so I think there's going to be a real appetite for the material that you put out there in, uh, in the after of all your wonderful research at the moment. Yeah, fantastic. All right. Well, thanks again, mate. It's been a real pleasure. And um, likewise, look forward to everything you're doing and look forward to seeing you again. Yes, absolutely. We'll have another conversation and compare notes again. Okay. All right. Have a great day. Talk to you soon, I hope. Same to you, mate. Bye. Bye bye.